Welcome everybody and Mark again. Thank you and welcome. Um, thank you for the time. Um, it is quite interesting that um, this is our first international meetup with anybody. So um, th thank you very much and thank you also for Dan who um, organised this really on behalf of the students. Um, and it was really good timing project wise, but really interesting um, the topics of the work that you're doing. Um, over in America as well and online and I have been binge listening to your podcasts but I'm just going to leave the introduction bits and everything up to you and I think you've got a presentation and please people questions pop them in the chat and there'll be ample opportunities at the end to kind of um, to ask questions and just have that conversation so um, Mark uh, my pleasure to hand over to you thank you very much Awesome, appreciate it. Uh, happy to be here. I'm excited to uh, spend some time with you all. Uh, I'm currently in Los Angeles, California. It's a little, it's weird outside. It's like gray, but warm. Um, not sure what that's about, but uh, uh, here we are. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna go share my screen and get started. All right, yeah, and uh, yeah, feel free to, to ask any questions in the chat. Uh, I have a few questions on my own towards the end if there are crickets in the classroom, but uh, typically what I like to focus on is a bit more of a, of a dialogue with, with those in the audience. So I'll go through the presentation in about 20, 25 minutes and then just have a, a conversation with y'all. All right, here we go. Household goods made out of captured CO2. Jewelry made out of captured CO2. Shoes made out of ocean plastic waste. Leather made out of pineapple or mushrooms. Devices that we use on a daily made out of fungus. Objects that we use daily made out of ground coffee ground. The ability to be able to see air quality wherever you are in a city. And being able to read important information with using algae as your ink. So I want to zoom out a little bit more. And so some of the products that I showed you are in fact in the world right now. Some of them are still in concept phase. Um, but these are the types of products and technologies that we're no doubt going to be experiencing and interacting with in the coming years. But I want us to think a little bit bigger. I want us to zoom out a little bit more. So imagine a world as a whole, cities living in harmony with nature, people living in harmony with buildings, nature living in harmony with buildings. Today we see ourselves at a fork in the road are we going to support those making a world that benefits all living species? Are we going to design better products that do less or no harm to our planet? Or are we going to stay in line with the status quo? Are we going to keep doing what we've been doing, extracting precious resources, finite resources from our planet? With everything going on in the world, we might feel hopeless. There's so much to keep tabs on. There's so much despair and challenges that we're facing. But something I like to think about is that we know the, how to solve some of these challenges. It's that we need to get out of our own way. Uh, this is a really amazing poster by Art Chantry, one of, uh, uh, one of the design legends out there. We have met the enemy and he is us. And so, as I mentioned first, we need to get out of our own way. And one way of doing that is to change the narrative. We're tired of this doom and gloom narrative, this whole everything's screwed up, the world's on fire, all that stuff doesn't really get us out of bed in the morning, it doesn't really excite anyone to step up and do something about the climate crisis. And so we need a new narrative. We need something that's gonna rally people together to allow everyone to feel as if they can step up and take climate action. 
So what if we were to start to talk about this in more of a doom and bloom narrative where we talk about all the amazing opportunities, products and services and systems that we can build that actually benefit people and the planet. Uh, so The Determine is a studio that I co-founded uh, over four years ago, and it is at least me and my business partner's attempt to change that narrative. We are a design, strategy, and creative consulting studio for a climate resilient world. We work with organizations working on the climate crisis. And so if I had to explain this to my 15 year old niece, I would say that we make climate focused projects look good. So that's everything from branding to websites to logos and things like that. Sound awesome. So think messaging, think communications, social media, uh, be seen, marketing tactics and all that stuff so that those organizations get the support that they need, whether that's more funding for a project, more users, um, whatever that call to action might be. We do all this stuff so that those people on the front lines can be as successful as they can be. But I will say this, that our perspective, myself and my business partner and a number of people that we work with, our perspective towards climate is a little bit different than others. And we're not really afraid to speak up and call certain things out. One of the ways that we're speaking up is to change the narrative around sustainability. So yes, sustainability is great. Um, sustainability is the ability to exist consistently with no change at all. It generally refers to the capacity for the biosphere and human civilization to coexist with one another. It's the ability to be maintained at a certain rate or level. So without going up or down, but just sustaining at that, right? But a question about sustainability is when we talk about it, what do we actually hope to sustain? So when I look out the window, I see a lot of things that I'd rather not sustain, but rather improve, change, or solve. So we feel like we need to go beyond sustainability and actually talk a bit more and bring more conversations around regeneration into the conversation, into the narrative around climate change. And so regenerative concepts take sustainability to the next level, moving from doing less bad to actually doing good for the people on the planet. Regeneration is a process of renewal and re restoration that makes life and ecosystems resilient to natural fluctuations or events that cause disturbance or damage. So we started here just a few centuries ago before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we had an abundance of natural resources. We were able to live in harmony with nature and one another. And then through consumerism, capitalism, this buy, buy, buy mentality, we were extracting finite resources. We were depleting natural resources. We were causing pollution. And that majority of that, of those actions were the things that cause or are causing global warming, climate change. And so if we're only sustaining where we are right now, all we're doing is just keeping at that level. But how do we actually get back up here? How do we get back to that level that where we started from centuries ago? And this is where regeneration comes in play. So in contrast to sustainability, regeneration refers to the restoration, renewal, and growth. So in other words, regeneration doesn't sustain, but rather improves upon the previous state. So that perhaps we can go beyond where we initially started and go further than where we started so that we can shoot for something that's never been achieved before. And so I wanted to just quickly bring up systems thinking. I'm not sure if this is covered in your classes. Um, I'm going to take a few, uh, the next few slides I'm going to take out of my buddy Eric Benson's book, um, Designed to Renourish. It's a really great book, um, an amazing example of a handful of case studies in the design world, everything from product design to graphic design that emphasizes systems thinking and their approach. But um, this graphic is in that book, and this is a really simple graphic that I love to show when I talk about systems thinking. So you have the sun as the source of energy that fuels this tree, and then from there it just branches out and gives life to so many different creatures and systems and things and how they're all, this graph shows how all of that is interconnected, interrelated. So I want to show you a, a few examples of some uh, of some scenarios in which systems thinking can be applied to. So warming oceans, that's caused by, by climate change, creates more storms, which then creates more floods. 
which then creates property damage and loss of food production in certain areas of, at least in the US, but also around the world. And so from there, that all creates economic breakdown and loss of jobs, all because of our oceans warming and how those ocean and how the rising temperatures of the ocean is affecting our climate. Another example, sea level rise creates flooded cities, which creates climate refugees and economic breakdown. People are moving away from low lying coastal areas, moving inland, which also creates stressed infrastructure and resources to those new cities, those new areas in which people are moving to. So some of these medium sized cities, perhaps 100 to two miles in from the coast, are not gonna be able to handle this, flux, this, this wave, this flux of people moving in over the next couple decades. And so that city, um, you know, again, 102 miles in coast, they're not gonna be able to handle all that stress, which then creates civil unrest and xenophobia. Hey, don't move here, we don't want you here, right? And so from all of that causes hate and xenophobia that will no doubt affect people's lives and, and cause violence and civil unrest. Uh, one last example, droughts, they create dry conditions in forests, which creates massive wildfires, something I'm very used to living in California, which then creates displacement of people and loss of property, which then creates physical and mental health issues. There is a, a conversation that we are not having within the larger context of climate change around mental health issues. What is that stress doing to people that are, that have to have fled uh, their homes with only an hour notice, right? What does that do to someone's um, emotional state, right? So all of these things, again, these are not, this is not an exhaustive list of things that's happening in, in, uh, because of climate change, but all these things are interrelated, you know? And so for me, that's just, one way of how I look at climate change is that it's not affecting any one region or any one people, but it's going to, and it has been affecting so many different things. And so the case for systems thinking, again, a lot of this stuff is from my buddy uh, Eric's book. Uh, it eliminates waste. If you really look at things through that systems thinking lens, when you start a new project, you're able to see opportunities for you to eliminate waste and to really streamline your supply chain, streamline your manufacturing, if that's something that you're, you're working on. Uh, it's the ability to re-nourish nourish our planet so that we don't put so much stress on precious resources that we can actually uh, plant new resources and give our planet enough time to, to regrow, re-nourish certain uh, resources. Uh, it's the idea of creating with the people that you're designing for, not so much designing for them. I don't know if this is something that's been covered, but uh, there's a phrase that you can easily just Google design imperialism. Uh, it's a really interesting topic. Um, basically in a nutshell, it's saying that, hey, designers, don't just come in to a, an area um, uh, or a particular part of a country and just helicopter in, fix something through your design skills and then just leave. You have to actually create with the people on the ground, create with your users, right? Put them in the center of everything that you do. You're not designing for them. You're not designing for yourself, but you're designing with these people in mind. Uh, they live, eat and breathe where they are. Uh, they are the ones dealing with the challenges and problems on a day-to-day -day basis. All you're doing is lending your creative skills to help with that. Uh, have a purpose and something that's not just for profit. Um, I feel like because of the pandemic and climate change is, is knocking on our door, uh, a lot of people are in fact waking up and questioning our existing capitalistic structure and thinking hard and long about the idea that, hmm, maybe we need to address this. And so can we insert more purpose in the work that we do in our, uh, in our societies so that we can approach a problem with more empathy, more sympathy, more, uh, more compassion, and not just look at, look at projects, look at work through the lens of profit. 
And then another thing it, to think about is that it advocates for marginalized voices. As I mentioned just a few seconds ago, you know, some of the people that are being affected by climate change are people in, in low income communities, people on the on near uh, fossil fuel uh, facilities, things like that, people on low lying coastal regions around the world. Uh, those are the people that are going to be affected and are being affected by climate change. And so how do we then raise their voices? How do we then bring them into the larger conversation? Unfortunately, those who have benefited most of, of destroying the planet are those who are probably not going to feel the effects of it until the very last part of that, that line, right? And it's so unfortunate that those who did not contribute or have not contributed to our climate crisis are those that are going to be feeling it sooner, early on. <clears throat> so where do designers and other creative folks, where do, where do designers fit into all of this? So as designers, we need to reconsider how we design, what we put out into the world and where we spend our energy. So it's no secret, our world is heating up. We have scientists and researchers on the front lines um, doing the hard work addressing our climate crisis but too often their message comes out muddled, uh, failing to convince people to change behavior or policies quickly enough to make an impact. And so designers are a special group. We use creativity to solve complex problems. We have the ability to visualize ideas, to help communicate really important messages, to design interactions that encourage others to take action. What's the call to action? What's the main thing we want people to do? Whether it's sign a pledge, download a thing, buy a thing, um, donate, whatever that might be. I personally feel like designers are a really special um, group of people that can use all of our creative talents that we learned in school and after to apply to the climate crisis. And so we think all designers from all disciplines, all industries, can do their part to step up. It's gonna take a, a top-down, bottom-up approach, all hands on deck, whether you're working in-house at a small studio, or I'm sorry, working in-house in a company or in a small studio, uh, full-time or freelance. Uh, we don't care what you do as long as you at least take some aspect in your work and, and touch upon the climate crisis. And as designers, we have a responsibility to zoom out and consider our impact, the things that we make and the waste that we produce. But how exactly do we do that? So the next few slides are, are is a snippet of something that me and some friends wrote a few months ago. So here's what we believe. Here's, here's what we think designers, how designers can do all this. So first, uh, designers must challenge and examine the histories, processes, and ethics of design and develop new creative skills, resources, collaborations, and language of design. We must support community-based efforts of justice, healing, coexistence, and mutual respect. We must understand that we are not outside of nature, but we are in fact part of nature, that we are part of this complex system and our actions must reflect that knowledge. We must reverse our profession's priorities in favor of more inclusive, empathetic, and engaged forms of action towards regeneration, exploration, and co-creation of a non-exploitative, non-appropriative set of social environmental relations, shifting that mindset that goes beyond sustainability, as I talked about earlier. We must commit to reconnecting design, manufacturing, distribution, and the use of things we design to the earth and all of its inhabitants. And lastly, we must direct our skills for the betterment of humanity towards a more ecological civilization. And we believe that these principles should be integrated into more multidisciplinary design pedagogy, design schools uh, within certain sectors and industries. We need to work with not only internally our design industry, but also other industries as well. Everyone needs design, everyone needs designers. And so can we be that vessel of bringing all these important questions and processes into as many sectors, as many industries, as many companies as possible. So what I just shared was a snippet of the fourth edition of the First Things First Manifesto. Uh, me and some friends co-authored this fourth edition. Um, when was that? April of 2020, earlier this year. And so with the ongoing destruction of essential living systems on our planet, 
this message has only grown more urgent. And so this year we renewed the previous manifestos with a greater sense of urgency as we see the comp compound effects of our climate crisis unfold before us. And it really is imperative that we all take climate action now. And so if you're motivated, if you're passionate about this stuff, I highly encourage you to sign the manifesto. Um, go to First Things First 2020. We have over 1300 people already signed it over the course of a handful of months. And we're really excited as picking up a lot of momentum. Um, it's translated into 17 different languages now. Um, so if you know an, a certain language that's not listed on the, uh, on the website, please feel free to reach out. And so one way that we're kind of continuing the conversation from just signing the manifesto is offering more concrete resources and solutions to those who signed it. And one of those is, in fact, climatedesigners.org. And so climatedesigners.org is a project that me and my business partner created through the studio. So it's a, think of it as a project without a client that we launched back in October 2019. And it was a really simple idea. Long story short, um, we became known within our design friends and our design community as the climate designer folks. And we're like, hmm, we can't surely be the only designers out there interested in working on in, on climate. And so we started to think a little bit more about it. And sure enough, of course, we had friends and other people that we knew that were in fact working on climate, other designers. And so we put together a really simple landing page. We bought the domain name, we bought a month subscription to Squarespace, and we put maybe four hours of design work into that landing page with, you know, bold headlines and copy and uh, an email sign up box. And we said, hey, let's consider this a small bet. Let's consider this a prototype and let's give ourselves a month and see if it sticks or not. And it was either going to, going to in fact stick, going to be something or fail and we just kind of brush it off and move on. <laughs> and, and sure enough, um, it did grow into something. And within that first month, we had a number of email subscribers to our, our, uh, our email list um, wanting to learn when we launch. And then me and my business partner said, oh crap, I guess we got to design this thing. We got to build this thing out. We didn't even know what we were doing really. <laughs> and so, um, so as of right now, fast forward about 14 months, uh, we are now uh, much more than a landing page. We are a hub for designers and creative professionals from all industries committed to using our creative skills for climate action. Our mission is twofold, to encourage and empower designers to use their creative talents for climate change, for climate action, and to inspire, motivate, and graduate climate designers by providing climate focused resources for design educators. So not only do I have the studio that I run with my business partner, but I also teach part time at a design school called California College of the Arts. I've been teaching there since uh, 2014, I believe. And so design education is a, it's a passion of ours. My business partner and I, we co teach together sometimes. And so we feel like we couldn't have this conversation without incorporating inviting design schools into this. And so I'm just going to share quickly with you um, what Climate Designers is right now at a glance. So uh, something that we launched a few months ago was a get started guide. And one of our community members actually based in Boston, Massachusetts, she put this amazing Google Doc together and shared with our community. Um, we have an online platform, which I'll get into in a minute. And we loved it so much that we actually worked with her on establishing it um, to making it a little bit more official as if it came through climatedesigners.org. And the reason why we wanted to do this is because around the same time, this is all perfect timing, around the same time, uh, we started to hear from a lot of passionate designers from you know, early on in their careers, all the way to seasoned professionals saying, hey, Mark, hey, Sarah, I love what you're doing. I just don't know how to become a climate designer. I don't know how to start. And so it's one thing to wake up and have this epiphany of, oh, crap, our world's on fire. I want to do something about it to actually doing something about it. There's that gap in the middle. And so we feel like this Get Started Guide closes that gap. And so if you go into it, it provides a ton of different resources, uh, links, uh, information on what um, what you can do as a designer. Um, so it's just a really great guide to get you started on taking that climate journey. We feature amazing uh, designers from all over the globe taking climate action. So we have kind of a featured profile 
uh, section of the website. So think about it as like a Behance. I don't know if you know of, of Behance, but think of it as like a Behance for climate change. And so we have a handful of people that we uh, highlight on the website showcasing their climate work, a little bit of a bio profile page, and then links to their, to their website. Uh, we have a podcast and we, we, we interview designers and educators, asking them to tell us a bit more about their climate journey, um, tell us when they had their climate epiphany, what they're doing now, how they're incorporating uh, all, of, all of their design skills into the climate crisis and, and how, to make a, how to be successful, how to make a living out of it. And so uh, we have a, a handful of podcasts up now. We have a few more in the pipeline coming up in the next few months. So definitely check it out. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, et cetera. We have uh, different chapters uh, around the globe. There is actually a really active chapter in the UK uh, where we have people that run these chapters that uh, kind of know the lay of the land, whether it's a certain city or region around the world. And um, we ask them to do one event per quarter, one virtual event, and then uh, engage with their local communities on our online platform and each chapter has its own little mini network uh, social network on our platform which i'll get into in a minute but uh yeah we're looking to grow we have people interested now in starting a chapter in australia um and uh, montenegro actually and so we're trying to go beyond the us and uh, and get more go more global with our chapters so if anyone is interested in perhaps partnering up with the UK chapter, the two women who run it are badass women. I, I, they're, they're super amazing women. They do a lot of great stuff. Or perhaps starting a more localized chapter, just let me know. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, we have an online platform. We launched this back in March of this year, and we just surpassed 1,000 members. Um, it's an amazing opportunity to network and collaborate with other designers from around the globe. Uh, we have uh, monthly meetups every third Saturday. That's how actually, uh, that's how Ben, or I'm sorry, um, uh, Dan uh, came in and, and, and learned more about us. And, um, and yeah, it's just a fun platform. It's very active. You can ask for advice. You can ask for resources. Uh, we do a number of events. We have two events coming up, actually. We have one event focused on climate policy uh, in the U.S., but with some consideration around international policy, specifically because of the new Biden administration. So if anyone is interested in climate policy, uh, definitely, uh, definitely check it out. And then we have another event with uh, someone who just started Clean Creatives, which is very similar to what we're doing, but in the advertising world. Um, focusing on, you know, encouraging ad agencies to stop working on fossil fuel company accounts and other destructive industries. And so he, we have an AMA with that person who started Clean Creatives. Um, and so, yeah, we have a lot of events coming up. And we also just launched today early bird tickets for our uh, multi-week virtual summit that's happening in March. So that's going to be a global event, of course, where we're going to have events spread throughout the whole two weeks, where uh, we're going to talk a lot about uh, systems thinking, behavior change, um, uh, all the all the topics that we feel would be uh, important for designers to actually step into that climate designer role. We're not going to teach your typical design workshops. It's going to be all the other supporting the topics and, and resources that we feel designers need to know when it comes to addressing our climate crisis. Um, as I mentioned, uh, design education is a big role. And so we have a whole education component to this. And so if you go to CDEDU, uh, you'll see a lot of our resources that we're putting together slowly but surely for design educators to bring climate related projects into the classroom. And so the screenshot here that you're looking at is, uh, is something where any design structure at a high ed institution and perhaps even um, primary uh, can can actually take one of these projects and bring into their design classrooms. They can modify it a little bit if they want, but basically we're offering free project briefs that, that are focused on climate. And so again, how cool would it be to graduate climate designers, right? With, with this next wave of leaders coming up in both the design industry and beyond, um, how cool would it be to start from, from the root, right? Start from, from square one and inspire and encourage young designers to, to do this full time. So I wanna zoom out even more as I wrap up. And so, as I mentioned early on, uh, we see this 
crisis as more of a doom and bloom opportunity where we see it as a gift. We see climate change as a gift, as an opportunity. And we can't run away from climate. We can't flip a switch and turn it off. It's here to stay. And we're either going to ignore it or we can all rally together and step up and do something about it. And so I'd rather do the latter. I'd rather step up and be part of the solution and imagine all the new products and new jobs and new economies and the new systems, all the things that we can create because of this crisis. I'm a firm believer that everything in life is invented. Uh, everything from, you know, the car to the internet, obviously, to the idea of, of restaurants and even the ideas of schools and capitalism, right? Everything that we live and use and interact with at some point has been invented by someone. Okay, so if you take that approach, then what new things can we come up with? What new products, new systems that we can invent based on this challenge, based on this problem that we're facing? And then what tools do we have access to now that can help us shape that future? How can we shape new products and new services with the tools that we have access to? And then the tools coming up down the pipeline, right? We are seeing a lot of, of resources and, and energy being put into AR and VR. Uh, we have a lot of voice activative devices now, um, you know, remote collaboration. We have all these new tools coming up on the horizon. And so how can we use all these to then, again, shape that future that we want? And then so I personally feel like our climate crisis is an opportunity for us to wake up and reevaluate our existence. I think the pandemic, I hate to say this and I'm not belittling the pandemic, but I think the pandemic came at a really good time for us to see what a shock in our system can do. And I don't know if you've seen this climate meme around, it's an illustration, all, the, all these different tidal waves, different size tidal waves going over and crashing on a little house. The pandemic is one little wave and climate change is a bigger wave right after that. And so I think the pandemic kind of jolted us and made a lot of people wake up and realize, wow, how we've been living currently hasn't been good, <laughs> right? As simple as that. And so I believe climate is an opportunity for us to wake up and reevaluate our existence and embrace this crisis in a way that we can craft a new narrative. So what new story can we create for our species? The narrative that we've been operating under for so long, this idea of go through school, graduate with a degree, find that full-time job, you know, marry someone, start a family, and dot, 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 like check off the, those boxes. Um, in my case, it's like the American dream, right? Like we've been sold that narrative. Uh, I don't know if anyone is familiar with Edward, um, Edward, um, uh, oh shit, I'm blanking on his last name. Um, uh, it'll come to me in a second. He's the nephew of Sigmund Freud. And he basically was the godfather of public relations back in the early 1900s. And he single-handedly crafted these narratives around how we should live on the world in the world so that we can consume and buy so that these companies can make money and profit off of that right but that in and of itself is not sustainable and so if someone else created that narrative for us why can't we create a new narrative for our own sake right and so i really do believe climate is just a symptom of our own problems and issues and so you know once we solve climate great uh what what's the next issue what's the next problem crises that we're going to find ourselves in. I think we have to really spend some time asking ourselves some deep, deep questions and embrace some of our, our faults and some of our shortcomings as a species and acknowledge that and then hopefully reconcile with that and reconcile with the people that we've um, uh, belittled and, and we've, we've taken advantage of so that we can move on and deal with what's in front of us so that we can move on and, and create that new narrative and we can solve this thing. So I can totally get more into that, but I know that this is not that kind of class. But um, so again, as designers, we need to reconsider how we design and what we put out there into the world and where we spend our energy. And so designers sitting on this call, we have a responsibility to zoom out, consider our impact and the things that we make and the ways that we produce. And so I ask you this one question, are you ready to do that? Are you ready to step up and take climate action in the work that you're doing? 
So thanks for your time. You can feel free to email me if you want to elaborate on some of the stuff that I talked about. I'm more than happy to do that. Um, I can go off on so many different tangents um, with this stuff. I get really excited and passionate about this, but I'll, I'll hold off on that. <laughs> so um, I do have a few questions I always carry in my back pocket for talks in case there's any crickets around, but I will hold off on those. I'm not sure if there's any questions out there that um, we would want to answer now. So, so that's it. Oh, Mark, th 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 thank you very much from my perspective. Um, I think Summers put it in the chat as well. Um, Edward Bernays was the... Uh, ah, the next Bernays, group. yes, um, yes, thank you. Ha have you seen um, Century of the Self, the documentary? Yes. That, that is... Um, is a, I made... Is I a, made is, yep. Scary watch. Don't watch it to cheer yourself up, but <laughs> it's definitely, it's definitely yes. worth the watch to consider where we are and how um, we've kind of found ourselves in this situation. Um, and it, it reminded me of a conversation I heard a while ago online. It, you know, doctors and nurses sign up, they do a Hippocratic oath, don't they, once they start serving. So, you know, should, this is a question to our, our students really, should designers do a kind of a, an oath in, in terms of how they're gonna apply their skills and their knowledge. Because the world doesn't need any more products. We don't need any more stuff made out of any material really, but we do need better stuff and stuff made out of better material. Um, and the old guys, you know, my generation and the ones that came before us kind of put you in the mess. Um, they might help you out of there, but you're the young guys coming through who has to kind of tackle this head on and force the old folkies to kind of make a change. And I'm, I'm, I'm an old folkie now as well. <laughs> I'm not that, yeah. Right, um, Jack, we've got a question. Right, switch your cameras on, please, people. It would be good to have a, uh, a bit of a thing going. And if you're asking a question, definitely cameras on. Where is he? Oh, there he is. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this. Um, uh, you, you spoke a minute ago about a bit of a eureka moment. I think I'm having mine at the moment, I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> definitely with, with the, the different products that have come out, the ones that you showed at the start. My question's a bit of a personal one, so I apologise if I do touch a nerve with it. Um, but I was wondering how you deal with people's views on the stereotypes of designers that go into environmentally friendly products. So what I mean by that is for people that, um, you know, the kind of stereotype is that people kind of go, well, you're a bit of a tree hugger, you're a bit of a hippie. How do you kind of deal with that kind of backlash? Uh, good question. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't listen to them. <laughs> <Fair enough>. um, <laughs> well, yeah, so, so a few things. Um, I mean, yes, I'm, I'm half joking, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't have... There, there's so many ways I can answer this. So I really appreciate the question. It's not personal at all. And I'm all about diving deep and, and being personal. It's, it's, my, that, it's my MO. Um, do y'all know James Murphy? The, uh, the guy behind LCD sound system? Yes. Yeah. He has a really famous quote that I, I have in one of my presentations. Uh, Don't complain, make things. Okay. You know, and so yeah. I, I love that. And, and, and to go back to your question, Jack, uh, with that quote, you know, for me, I don't, I don't care what people think. And maybe this is just my upbringing, but I'd rather spend my time and energy doing the work. Right. You know, I'd rather just focus on the thing that gets me excited, the thing that I find joy in, yeah. and the the places that I shine bright. And so that's where I rather put my energy, not so much thinking about what other people think about me. Now, so this way I'm not complaining about, oh man, everyone thinks I'm a tree hugger or whatever. I'm like, screw that. I'm just going to make stuff. And yeah, okay. whether you're on board or not, that's your call. You know, uh, we're all adults here. You know, you can make up your own decisions. Um, and I think another way of answering that, Jack, is I don't, so, so an approach that we take with our clients we are anti polar bears on icebergs. We're anti, you know, the, the, the image of the globe with hands holding it, you know, like we don't need any more of that BS imagery in the climate crisis space, in the climate change space, right? Um, for so long, people thought that that was the visual vernacular that those types of companies and those 
those types of efforts needed to have? No, no. And, and I think at the same time, at the same time, we have companies like Apple and Ikea and a lot of these larger companies that have elevated design, right? People now expect good design they people now like even my my family members who are way down like they don't even know what design is really i mean besides the stuff that i share with them um they they will know what bad design is before they know what good design good design should be more or less invisible or at least wow you but people now know what bad design is because it, it doesn't work it doesn't give them the thing that they want right and so with a lot of these non-climate focused companies raising that design bar if you want to be a, a climate focused organization that wants to be successful, you have to elevate your design work. You, you can not succeed if you're continuing that narrative or that visual vernacular of polar bears on ice caps or the, the leaf as your logo. Like none of that, none of that ever worked in the past. I don't know who officially approved that visual language for these types of environmental initiatives, but uh, that's why you're seeing a lot of climate and environmental startups and nonprofits and organizations now embracing just cool looking stuff. I mean, of course there needs to be substance to it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that just put a nice sheen over it. It's going to solve it. But in terms of the visual aesthetic and stuff, uh, I think, I think people now are waking up and realizing that good design really does matter and that people really need to invest in it. Um, and then also another way to answer that, um, like who's against clean air? Who's against healthier foods? Who's against more jobs? Who's against all the ben positive benefits if we were to address our climate crisis? Um, one approach, and I'll, I'll say this one last thing and then I'll shut up for another question. One approach that I love to explore with a new client is let's not actually even bring up climate change as a phrase. Let's just not even bring it up. Let's highlight the work that you're doing that might benefit um, you know, an environment in a certain region with cleaner air, healthier foods, dot, 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 more jobs, etc. Oh, and by the way, we'll address climate. Like, let's not even bring it up as we, you know, when we launch the campaign or when we like meet someone for the first time, let's maybe bring it up in like the, the footnotes, <laughs> you know, because unfortunately climate change has become so politicized and uh, divisive that uh, people at times get turned off by it, which is so unfortunate. And we're just, slowing down our progress as a as a communal as a as a, uh, as a collective species in tackling this so could there be a way to address all this stuff that you're wanting to address without even yeah. you know without even bringing it up i don't know no, i appreciate that i suppose like kind of maybe the idea on that one then is for instead kind of let go of the past sort of idea isn't it it's kind of let's let's build a better future rather than changing the past mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. Yeah. No, I appreciate the answer on that question. I, I, the, re the reason I was asking it was basically just because I know a lot of, uh, well, me, myself, I'm guilty of, of doing this. And I'm sure many other people are. Is the self-criticism thing where we feel like our idea is not going to be good enough to make that much of an impact. Mm -hmm. I mean, here's the other thing too. It's 2020. Some of the examples I showed at the start of the presentation, some of the product examples, you know, those materials and things, they're not quite at scale just yet, but yeah. who's to say that they're not going to be at scale? And so wouldn't you want to be on the forefront of these new technologies, new materials, new systems, new products? Um, at, at some point, the shift from doing what we've been doing and this old way of doing things to this new way of doing things is going to cross. And yeah. then that new, the new way of doing stuff is just going to make economic sense. There's an amazing um, economist, that I like to listen to and watch. Uh, his name is Tony Seba, S-E-B-A. He's a Stanford uh, instructor and he does a ton of different YouTube videos. Um, he has a ton of YouTube talks. And he just says, he calls out the fossil fuel industries and all these other big industries. He says, they are no doubt going to shift to renewables in the next 10 years because it just makes economic sense. They're not gonna do it because they wake up and realize that they have a change of heart, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, they're gonna do it just because it just makes economic sense for them to do it. And so I use that as an example of, of a larger example, but on a personal, more smaller, uh, smaller uh, scale example that going down this route for any company is just going to make sense. And so why not be at the forefront of that? Why not be a designer who can speak the climate literacy, who can understand climate change 101, who can understand all these things that they can incorporate in their work so that when you do in fact work for a company, you are 
not, not only a great designer, but you also possess all that amazing knowledge that they don't have to hire two different people. They can hire just you who plays both the designer and the climate person. Um, no, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Right, who, who else has got a question? I apologize, the heavens have opened here in Bangor, so the background noise is rain from my end. Um, so I'll try and keep my mic off. Any, anybody would like to ask a question? It's like summer, yeah. <laughs> um, so I have a follow on from that. Um, I think, obviously we all want to do better for the environment, but it can be quite deterring, as Jack said, when you don't feel like maybe your ideas are good enough. But furthering from that, I feel like I'm, every time I feel like I'm learning more and you're getting more into an environment thing, you learn that what we think is good for the environment actually might not be. For example, I always thought recycling and recyclable materials were the way forward. And then very recently I found that's completely untrue. Yeah. Uh, with paper, I always thought like, oh, paper stuff and cardboard stuff is so much better. And I very recently had a conversation about how actually a lot of this rise in use of paper factory and stuff is actually having quite detrimental effects on our rainforests and stuff because we're just harvesting and things can't grow back fast enough to be yeah. restoring it. And I guess how do you get past that mental block of how is it that every result, like I, they get to the point where you feel like every resource you get to is somehow going to end up being bad? Yeah, great question. Great question. So, so there's two, two things I'll, I'll address. Um, your point about, and Jack's point about um, not thinking that your ideas are good enough. Here's the thing. You all don't know better. You're not old enough to be, um, I guess, poison by existing systems, by working in the industry for so long, by kind of setting in your ways, by, you know, the status quo, by all that stuff. You're coming in with this, in this, uh, you're coming in with a very fresh perspective. And sure, some of those ideas might not ever work, but there might be one or two in there that actually could. And it's only those uh, fresh ideas that are worth exploring because you, again, you don't know anything, you don't know better. And that's great. I would actually use that, um, uh, that naiveness, if you will, uh, to your advantage. Right. And so then you get to a point like, okay, I have this crazy idea. I don't know how it's, if it's even going to work or not, but you know what, I'm going to try it. I'm going to pitch it to my boss or pitch it to my instructor, or my, my classmates, whatever. And then you should put your story hat on your storytelling hat. And then it's all about in my personal, I teach a, I also teach a, um, a portfolio building class uh, to get students ready to, for internships or when they graduate to get a job. And so one of the main things I stress uh, with that class and those students is storytelling. You have to be able to present your idea in a way that's compelling, in a way that will make the people who are listening to it say, holy crap, Summer, like, uh, yeah, let's try it. You know, we might not know all the answers right now, but let's just try it. Um, you have to build excitement and, and momentum so that you can get as many people on board as possible to help push your idea further so that you can then actually experiment and test to see whether or not it is actually, in fact, a good idea or a crappy idea. And guess what, y'all? We're probably going to have a thousand crappy ideas in a month, in a semester, right? So don't get so stuck on that first idea. I see so many of my students think of that first idea and think that that is the idea. It's like, no, 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 that's one idea, right? I can, again, go off and talk about that more. The, the, the second thing I'll mention that you brought up, Summer, is um, let's all be honest to ourselves and let's all just kind of call it out. This is all new to us. There is no guidebook. There's no playbook. There's no rule book on the climate crisis. We've never dealt with this at all. And so I think it's just going to take a lot of approaches, a lot of ideas. Um, sure, some of them are going to fail. Some of them might not ever succeed, but you'll, you'll find a few in there that will, in fact, succeed and blossom. Um, you know, there's a quote that, uh, that you might here in the climate space, you know, addressing our climate crisis, it's, it's going to take a silver buckshot as opposed to a silver bullet. It's not going to be any one solution that's going to fix everything because all of this is so interconnected. Again, thinking in systems, um, we're going to need a lot of different approaches from a lot of different angles from a lot of different industries. And so why not experiment? Why not try something? Of course, you need to put in thought and effort and, and, and kind of go through um, everything, you know, respectfully and all that stuff, but, um, but 
the way that I look at it is like, just try something, <laughs> you know, as I mentioned at the start of, of, well, when I, when I mentioned the climate designers initiative, um, we didn't know if this idea was going to stick or not. We just said, Hey, let's give ourselves one month. We might've invested four hours of design work. And then we paid for a domain name and a Squarespace site that ended up to be what 30 bucks total. And that was it. If it failed, we're 30 bucks and four hours in whoop de doo but ended up being successful and here we are now and so like never did i think that i was going to like start something like this last year i just felt that there was a need for something there was a gap in there and so whether it was what we have right now or something completely different we're just experimenting right sarah and i my business partner and i when we're running climate designers we tell our community all the time we don't know the answers. We're not pretending to know the answers. All we want to do is collaborate with our community members to figure out how we can get more designers on board to talk about this stuff and then implement it to step up and then take climate action. So I think we just have to all admit, like we don't know everything and that's okay. <laughs> and as soon as we recognize that, I think it just kind of puts the pressure off and we just can experiment and play and, and test out and, and just kind of have fun with it too. I th I think that's the other thing. One last point, and I know we're over time, but one last point, um, because this topic can become very overwhelming very fast, when we read the uh, paper, when we watch the, the videos, the documentaries, the news, all that stuff, it could be very discouraging and very uh, and, and full of, of despair and, and, and it doesn't motivate people to want to step up and do more of this. But again, I think that's why we really need to change the overall narrative to see climate change as an opportunity because we need everyone on deck to help out with this. And so, you know, find friends who are also caring about the same issues as you to, to create that support network, if you will. Um, find resources, whether they're newsletters, websites, videos, etc., that are talking about all the amazing things that are coming out of, of, of this space. Um, join our online community, <laughs> you know, to find that network, as Dan can, can attest to. But, um, but yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a tough, gnarly topic. Some days I wake up and I'm just like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Like, maybe I'll just get a van and just travel the world and not even focus on this. But another part of me is like, but I can't live, I wouldn't be able to live myself if I'm not at least part of the conversation contributing my skills to this. And so um, it's going to, it's different for everyone. Not everyone's going to have the same degree, same, same amount of passion, but even if it's nights and weekends, that works for us. Absolutely. Um, well, I don't want to add too much because I don't like adding when somebody says something because I think you've encapsulated it, but um, from my perspective, look, thinking of you as students as well, um, it's like a term of getting from zero to one, to that first version of something. That's the hardest part, people, okay? Um, and whatever that one is, going from one to two or 1.1, 1.2 is easier after you've kind of put something out there. Um, being able to kind of take some criticism and kind of put it in that mix and think about it um remixing it and going again and it's it's all experiences right the only difference between me and you guys is the i'm slightly older okay i'm a fair bit older but i've just got more experiences of making more mistakes and putting my foot in it than you guys have um and if you don't put yourself out there to do stuff um you're not going to get those experiences and there's no such thing as bad experiences they're just experiences and it's how you reflect on them and evaluate them and put them into your into the mix of who you are. Um, and that's why you're probably on a course to study design. Yeah, you like design, but you also want to make a difference in the world and a positive difference in the world. And we hear it when, when you come for interviews and we interview students for next year, that passion of making a change and like, there's something fundamentally wrong in the way we are existing at the moment. And I want to contribute to make the world a better place. Um, and the other thing, and I'll, again, I'll finish after this. Don't wait for anybody to give you permission to do that. You just take that on anyway. Okay. Don't expect me to tell you, yeah, now, now, now you're ready. Now you, oh yeah, wait for a month. And then I think you might be ready because you're never going to feel ready. So you might as well just crack on with it uh, and see what happens. Now, 
you're probably sitting there thinking, yeah, pretty, but how does this relate to the project that I'm working on? And that's, you're going to have to wrestle that. Have a think of that tonight and we can have a chat tomorrow, right? But do it, having a chat now is probably too early because you need to digest a lot of that messages that um, we're very fortunate for Mark to share with us um, this evening. So I, and I, I don't know, I propose I'll be on teams from 9am um, tomorrow. And if you want a big team, actually, I'll be in Blackboard at 9 tomorrow. And if anybody wants to join and have a chat, um, feel free to join that chat and we can go through some stuff and have a chat about the assignment and stuff and possibly link this in because it, it might mean a radical approach of how you approach this problem with a company that we are working on. It might be that the company is not thinking radically enough or enough in the future. And that strategy toolkit we shared with you last week, it might be now that you're shifting along that to make that company feel much more uncomfortable with what you might be offering. But actually, it's the right thing to do from your perspective. And that, that, that is another conversation and it, it, it's, a, it's a, um, yeah, something to, you know, dive deeper on in the, in the future, really. Um, so absolutely, yes, the climate, climate designers, I am also going to get that manifesto translated into Welsh for you, Mark. We'll put it through the uni translations and get that up on your website. Um, and I actively encourage everybody to um, join the UK chapter um, and get involved with those. And as Dan has demonstrated, who knows where these things lead to? Um, and it's only, it can only get better. Um, right, I've spoken enough. Any, any, any parting thoughts from anybody else? Anybody want to add, add something? I know we could we could probably speak all night and keep this going all day, but um, okay. Mark, thank you, <laughs> thank you very much for joining us. I don't know. Yes. I'm going to leave the leave leave the last words for you. <laughs> no pressure. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks for the invite. And again, um, as designers, we have a responsibility, whether you know it or not. We have a huge responsibility in the world, and so it's going to be up to you to figure out what you want to do with that and how you want to. Uh, yield that responsibility. So um, please join our community. It's an amazing uh, network. You can meet other people there. You can network uh, outside of your existing uh, network. And who knows, it might land you your first job or project or things. Um, and we're always looking for ways to, uh, to, yeah, to build out our network and to provide resources, collaborations, and events for you all. So um, hope to see you on the platform. Dan, again, thanks for reaching out. It was good to see you for the first time. We do have a, um, a global uh, event every third Saturday, which is where Dan uh, joined us last month. So maybe we'll see you, I guess, what, on the 19th? So, all right, everyone, I have to jump off for a call, but uh, good luck with the rest of the project and uh, be well, be safe.